Alright guys, how to go back again today. Hope you're all doing well and enjoying your day so far. I'm with the New York Subliners currently going from strength to strength. Clays has got to figure out on the bench right now what exactly he is going to do going forwards. Explaining his plan for potentially retiring at the end of this year, but also saying in a relatively similar breath that he might already have offers on the table for CDL 2023. Very much intrigued to your thoughts in the comment section below. Hit the like button if you enjoy. Subscribe if you're new as always. Oh, greatly appreciate it. Really to the channel. Thank you very much indeed for doing that one. Plenty to dive into today. First of all, wanted to mention this real quick from Chrome because there's been we've talked lately well we haven't really talked about it that much actually that's why I thought I mentioned it now but the Tommy gun is um is a weapon in this game of course I'm pretty sure it looked exactly the same as what it did back in the World War Two days but it has been a weapon that players Cammy, Temp and John have all kind of tried out we saw back in Modern Warfare that the Uzi came into the meta towards the end of the year Envoy was kind of known for using that one there are a few tweaks that made it not particularly viable towards the end of the game but um yeah often there are guns in these games that um you know the pros kind of gravitate towards the auto or the MP40 but there might be some other guns out that actually are viable. The Tommy gun might be one of them in certain situations. There has been people that have said that like um, it has a faster movement speed, so you can like early opening breaks and stuff. You can actually get places faster than you would be able to otherwise. Whether this gun is viable, I'm not really sure. But like the fact that some players are using this rather consistently is in like it doesn't seem like despite um, well some players have had pretty good success with it, some most certainly haven't. But um, regardless of that, it seems like some pros are still pulling it out. So I wonder whether this will actually have any impact going forward because on certain hard points, certain situations, this Tommy gun could be viable and who knows if there's other guns in the game as well that um, also could be viable up against something like the MP40 right because it's a decent weapon the MP40 the auto has got somewhat better as well with a 30 round mag nowadays but um, yeah I do wonder whether at some point of the season we will see another kind of shift maybe more heavily towards a weapon like this one where more players start pulling it out people realize it's OP or you know whatever the case might be it gets G8 we get a bit of drama it's happened the last couple of years really with the UZ and um, if you guys remember back in Modern Warfare as well with the um, with the org actually right when that was kind of pulled out and since it got this 4P and then the pros wanted to GA it, which is basically what happened right after that. So whether, um, you know, Doug maybe needs to pull this gun after a rank play or something, and then it's going to get GA'd. But, um, you know, this I thought was interesting from Cronin. He said right now, Tempers use it twice on P5 Tuscan. Can we use it during a Berlin control while inside the A point? So in certain situations, it can be viable. Wanted to mention this as well, I thought was kind of cool. So AYM Esports, new kind of, you know, Esports organization, picking up some of the Spanish guys, the so Journey, Eric Boom, Yako, and Super joining the team with a couple, I guess, the coaching stuff as well. This organization is actually owned by Manchester City player Laporte. So I thought that was kind of cool. Just, you know, good to see players like this and kind of entities in sports in general getting involved and picking up a Call of Duty team I thought was kind of nice. Let's talk about the subliner situation though. This I thought was also cool. I'm not really sure how Paul X got this footage, but uh, this is a clip from their match against Boston where Paul went on a crazy spree. And I'm pretty sure they didn't catch this on camera, but uh, okay, maybe they didn't catch all of it. I'm not really sure what's going on here, but it seems to be from his POV. And um, yeah, he's absolutely making some disgusting plays here to help close out the game against Boston when they're up 2-1 in the series. But obviously they've been looking good as of late. I'm sure Clay is looking at this situation now and thinking, okay, hang on a second here, Krim. Like, yeah, you've done very nicely. Obviously, like, me and Krim, or, you know, Clay and Krim, didn't really work all that well in, um, at least in 4v4 so far this year. But he's probably thinking, if I was in Krim's shoes right now with the players that he has, like, um, I would be getting good results with this team, as Krim 6 is at the present time. So, Clay, I'm sure he's understandably rather frustrated about that situation. And I think, to a degree, that's kind of spilled over to the drama that we have seen here the last few days. But, of course, Clay's got to figure out what's going on, because he said, I think there was a clip that came out from Doug Stream just before, like, subliners went to the Pro-Am Classic that if, if they kind of flopped to the Pro-Am then Clay was pretty confident he would get his spot back in the team and he was pretty confident that the management was kind of based on the, the way he was playing in trials that you know they would be able to put him back in for Krim and give that a go as it turned out though with Krim 6 they won the entire event right so unfortunately Clay is going to be sitting there on the bench you can imagine for quite some time to come and as we said it's been kind of spilling over to some drama that we've seen between the two of these guys the last few days but of course Clay has got to find an opportunity elsewhere if he does want to continue to compete that has been the big question mark will a team give Clay a go like he did some trials potentially for the Minnesota Rockers, certainly for the Subliners themselves, and it hasn't really worked out in him getting a spot right. It doesn't really seem all that likely for the rest of the season either, but maybe Clay still will take his talents of getting into drama, well, to some other organizations, right? And he said this actually, well, a few days ago now, this counter is going to go indefinitely. No spots, he says. It's like, well, this is basically the, the counter for how how long it's been since Clay still last fell off the map. Now, um, you know, it's obviously potentially he reckons it's going to go indefinitely because there's no spots. For the rest of this year, that seems more than likely. He is currently playing in the Challenger side. I'm 
I'm sure he doesn't want to stick that out forever, right? He's probably going to go to the Toronto Major 3 Challengers event they have there. And then at Major 4, it's actually Boston that are hosting a Challengers event one weekend before the main one. So that's probably what Clays is going to do with like Fellow and all these guys to have a good time, you know, basically do what Methods did, I suppose, last season. Go down there for a little bit and then try and get a spot at the start of next year. And given Clays' history and pedigree, like, um, you know, I think he will have offers on the table. And even though he didn't perform well at the start of the season in a pretty dysfunctional New York team, I definitely still think he has what it takes watching his stream and stuff. Like, I don't think the gunny has gone anywhere, to be perfectly honest. And of course, we've seen the last few months the fact that Scump, Crimsix, and Sasha, the three oldest players in the league now on starting teams outside of Claystair, have all won events this year. So I'm sure organizations won't necessarily look at the age thing as that much of a factor, given what the other guys are doing. But Clay has a few words to say on this. Firstly, talking about the fact that, like, he's had a much more fun time lately since he kind of stepped away for a couple of weeks and has got back into action here, kind of grinding in the challenger side. He's having a lot more fun actually playing Call of Duty than he was before in that very dysfunctional squad. But also talking about what his plans are for next season, right? Saying that effectively he wants to take some other main AR spots. He's good friends with the other main ARs, but business is business effectively at the end of the day. And then he also goes on to say, if you listen closely, that so, well, he had hella opportunities or hella like, a, well, basically team offers last season going into this year. He decided to, of course, stick with New York, bring in Crim6. That didn't work out for him. Crim gets him dropped for the team again, as this happens a couple of times, at least when Crim and Claire team together. The Clay's the one that kind of gets the short end of the stick in a difficult situation. But he also goes on to say, if you listen carefully, that he's also got hella offers for teams going into next season. But then in another clip, he says that if he doesn't get a starting team next season, that's probably going to be it and he's going to retire. When I, I took like a couple weeks off after I got like, when I initially got benched, I, I played even more expecting to hopefully get the spot back and then get back in the league somehow. But then after it became apparent that they weren't putting me back on and, and stuff, I took a couple weeks off. And then when I started playing like a week and a half ago, it was so much more fun than originally. Mm. Like, I don't know. A little mental, a little mental break or, maybe. Yeah, just a little reset or whatever. But like, I'm actually having so much fun playing COD. Like the last, couple, That's good. the last week or two of the New York team, dude, I was miserable. Like I was trying so hard and like having fun playing COD. But as soon as the scrims would load, the vibe just went to yeah. You know, it yeah, was yeah. just like everyone just... Uh, like, you know when a team's dead? Yeah, like of how they course I know when a team's dead. communicate with each other, like making fun of each other. That's how Perry like, sounds like. Plays. Every yeah, substitute on a CDL bench right now wants to see their team get that's done. That hard point for now. You can't tell me otherwise. <laughs> you can't <laughs> tell me <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> bro. Almost every man in the league I'm actually friends with. So I would actually, like, feel bad. No, you wouldn't. You would not. You would definitely take this spot. I would feel bad. It wouldn't change my outcome. Yeah, it wouldn't change the decision. But yeah, you still, yeah, I, I agree with that. It'll make you feel bad, but what are you going to do? It's not like somebody in the league where I'm like, this man I want his and I figured you would just go somewhere else. So just go find another team. It's not like you wouldn't get on a team. You know what I'm saying? Well, I had hell offers, bro. Yeah, as I'm saying, you're f***ing wet. You would have just went somewhere else, got a team, and every, everybody no would have been hot. <clears throat> Do you? <laughs> yes. I already got hella offers for next year. If I don't get on a team, by the start of next season, I'm going to just be done, dude. Jesus so I thought some funny comments really out of the guys actually because we've seen from Pentagram and even Gunless I think I shared a clip a little bit ago from Gunless when Los Angeles Grillers got reverse swept by uh, the Toronto Ultra North American Academy at the Major, the Forum Classic sorry and, uh, and Gunless was like oh no I, I can't believe they just lost that and um, I don't know if he was trying to act as if he actually wanted them to win but like it just seemed like he was just like okay come on lads they lost like get, get me back in the team effectively and that's of course what you might well imagine is going on for a lot of the subs. Clay probably wanted that to happen to the starting team of course Pentagram said this substitutes continue to prove their worth implying um you know in a similar vein right that maybe he and the starting los angeles thieves team could be a good idea but these are the kind of team standings right now and certainly going into next season if clay is right that maybe he has offers already on the table or even if that's not fully the case and, um, and other teams are considering their opportunities because a team like paris might just give him the bag anyway like um, even though it's a relatively small bag compared to the other teams that's why i didn't even highlight them in what we're just about to look at but as you can see we've got some top dogs like phase and optic they're not going anywhere but pretty much out Outside of that, any team could potentially make changes just because some of these teams, like they started off looking good, London, Boston, Breach, but towards the end of the year might be a different story. Some of these bottom dogs as well, like some of these you know, big name organizations are not going to make the world championship, which of course definitely indicates that something has to happen in the offseason. And I think there definitely is some potential for main ARs to swap around. This is what I put together. You guys might completely disagree with this. The red teams are the ones that I think are maybe slightly more likely. The orange teams are less so. I didn't even highlight the Paris Legion because let's say Paris Legion as an organization does 
does exist next year, which they probably will, but like hopefully someone will just buy them out or whatever. But like, does Clay really want to join that team? Like, a oh, gravity may or may not be there. He's been playing well the last few weeks, right? As their kind of main AR. But if Paris or if Clay says that like, I want to join Paris, and Paris is like, okay, yeah, let's get Clay in. It makes a fair bit of sense. We'll give you like the minimum salary of fifty grand or whatever. Like, does Clay really want to do that? Is it even worth it for him? Like, um, as a player, like with his kind of history, do you even want to play for Paris? Like, probably not. So I'm not really going to consider that to be honest. But again, you know, maybe he ends up on Paris. Who knows? Or another org that may well buy out Paris's spot if we get lucky here. And also expansion is a possibility, although I'm not really holding out too much hope for that one, to be honest, based on a few different reasons. But so here we go. We've got five teams that I'm kind of looking at. Of course, like phase optic, nothing's happening there. Subline is he's not going to go back there, you would imagine. But, you know, depends on the rest of the season is a complete shambles for them. It doesn't seem particularly likely. I feel like Toronto are going to pretty solid on their route. And also Los Angeles, Gwilas. I do feel like given they won an event this year, they probably will stick with Slasher as their main, which probably means there's not an opportunity there for Clayster. I didn't highlight London either because I believe they do probably want to build around the UK core that they currently have and Zero is there even though at the start of Modern Warfare there was a big rumour that actually Clayster was going to be going to that London Royal Ravens team but probably not going to happen anymore. So the other teams I've got highlighted Florida Mutineers I feel like it's relatively clear that they need like a leader really on the team. Obviously they already have a lot of main ERs but if they did want to build around a guy like Clayster and actually teach some of these guys how to win I think it might be a good idea. You would have to kind of blow up the roster obviously to bring Clayster in here because it's not going to work in you know if Midas Vivid plus Clayster would be one of the most hilarious roster moves of all time but it's you know it's not going to work so they're going to have to do some things that they want to bring clay in there seattle to me is maybe the most likely just because right now like accuracy with maxim and Prey, it's like what changes do you make with seattle a team that's not performing where they should be and i know that clayster has said that like okay mac doesn't really want to team with clay again which maybe this won't happen mid-season but like look if seattle go to the end of the year and don't get any particularly good results they don't make champs for example like um you know accuracy's tenure in call of duty might be coming to an end just because like if he couldn't get good performances out of these players they might say well look we have a lot of talented players here we've got these guys signed on for next year we can extend them on the one plus one contract let's give clay a go in this team and see if that works and see if he can get the best out of these guys as he did briefly with mac i suppose on the subliners last season so that i think is a possibility the other teams i've highlighted boston i don't think is out of the realms of possibility if they completely like fall off a cliff towards the end of the year i don't think method spot is necessarily safe it may well you'd imagine that they're going to build around methods again for next season he's been pretty damn good this year but i don't think it's any it's by no means guaranteed i would say at least on their current trajectory just because they even Clayster a few weeks ago said something along the lines of he thinks he's better than like six and main ARs in the league he reckons he's better than at least half the main ARs I reckon Method is in that category that he thought he was better than Minnesota as well as an interesting one because yes they've been improving but they're kind of main AR spots they don't really have one right now Priester is their main AR it's rather interesting there like if Priester continues to underperform like you know maybe Clay for Priester is an option and then Thieves I just wanted to mention them as well because Octane has definitely been looking better the last few weeks but uh, for the majority of the season he's probably been there well under performing player their most underperforming player I suppose probably their weakest link at least until the last couple of weeks and if they finish out the season very poorly like it's even possible they don't make the world championship right if that was the case then like surely they've got to blow it up and maybe the whole Kenny Octane reunion has to go down the drain it and Clayster could find a spot so difficult to say and I'm also sure that Clay wants to go to this team I'm pretty sure there was a tweet I saw of like a nature was saying okay who wants to join 100 thieves and Clay was there in the replies if Clay had to choose I reckon LA Thieves would be his option here but as for who he actually has offers from it's rather hard to say if at all but uh, he's also outlining exactly why he might well retire if he doesn't get a spot from these teams which I think is fair enough I don't really think he wants to or should grind through changes for another season like uh, look, if he doesn't get a spot next year it's probably time to call it a day but I honestly feel like he will given the way that some of these teams are going to have to seriously blow it up let's mention this actually because on this day yesterday back in 2015 it was UMG California where Optic took down FaZe to win a three straight events in a row the first actually with Karma returning to the lineup because Enable was in their team for a couple of events before then returning to FaZe before getting beaten by Optic in this grand finals this also just because because we see this every single year and it's still hilarious on this day yesterday in 2016 that's when eggs joined nature's 100 thieves to rock these absolutely phenomenal jerseys so this is kind of a, well the first outing of 100 thieves in competitive call of duty or really in esports in general a complete shambles of a team and an organization as it was at the time they failed to win a single map at mlg anaheim and therefore nature was like okay i'm chalking this up took effectively a couple of years off before returning in black ops 4 to much more success with a much more defined situation i just wanted to mention this actually from brian sats because i thought this was rather interesting we'll start off with this one actually from Black Ops 3. The most kills in a Grand Finals map. So Black Ops 3, interestingly enough, all of these came in map 1, which does make sense, actually, just because in Black Ops 3, there was four game modes, if you guys aren't familiar. It went Hardpoint, Search and Destroy, Uplink, Capture the Flag, Search and Destroy. So it really had to be map 1. I imagine a lot of these records were set on Fringe, just like, I reckon Formals 48 was set on Fringe. We really know, I don't know, like, Fringe was just a good map for getting a lot of kills, to be honest. But uh, yeah, these were the records for the kind of most kills had in a Grand Finals during Black Ops 3. And in Infinite Warfare, some actually rather similar numbers we see here well in IW 37 for the center at Vegas
yes, it was our season, Crim6, both with 44 in Atlanta. I think that ended up being the record for the year. But very much into your thoughts in the comment section below. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did enjoy it, hit the like button. Tell us YouTube gods. This is a good video. I don't like you should see it as well. And I've got the competitive Call of Duty community. Thank you as always. Take care of yourselves. And I'll see you next time.